Okay, so we continue with the last, what was supposed to be the last talk. We switch, switch the last two talks. <coughs> Clustered cepheids in Norma, a distant dwarf galaxy in the plane of the Milky Way. Can you give back the uh, microphone? Sorry. How's this? <laughs> All right, so I'm sort of an interloper in the uh, feedback session, and maybe I should hold this like this, avoid <laughs> feedback from the mic. But uh, I am going to be talking about work that's related to uh, gas dynamics. Uh, I'm going to talk about the recent discovery of clustered sapiot variables towards the Norma constellation that may mark a dwarf galaxy that uh, I'd earlier predicted. Is this okay, or should I? How's this? Okay, this is good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the recent discovery of cluster Cepheid variables towards the Norma constellation that may mark a dwarf galaxy that I'd predicted several years ago by using a dynamical analysis of disturbances in the outer gas disk of the Milky Way. So the basic idea is to analyze disturbances in the outer H1 disks of spirals, okay, such as the in M51. And I found by applying this method to galaxies like M51 that have optically visible tidally dominant companions that we can quantitatively recover the mass of the satellite and its location in radius and azimuth. So I'll talk about that briefly. I'll mostly focus on the uh, simulations that I've done to explain the perturbations in the outer H1 disk of the Milky Way. And recently, I've gone through the VVV survey, which is a fairly deep near-infrared survey of the galactic plane, to try and look for this dwarf galaxy that I predicted several years ago. So I think we all know there are a number of discrepancies uh, between uh, simulations and what we observe in the local group, such as structural discrepancies that have been pointed out earlier. Mass of satellites are too dense relative to observations. And I particularly want to point out the observational status quo in terms of the number of satellites that we know about at low galactic latitude, okay? At latitudes less than 30 degrees, we only know of one dwarf galaxy that's such dwarf galaxy. And this is really just the result of the current observational status quo, which may well be related to uh, problems that have been pointed out by the MON community in terms of the anisotropic distribution of dwarf galaxies. So in this context, it's interesting to ask if we can hunt for dark matter-dominated dwarf galaxies from analysis of their gravitational effects on outer gas disks. So M51 is a great prototype. Here's the uh, satellite on the optical image, and that's where it would sit in the H1. And the basic idea is to do a set of SPH simulations of M51 interacting with satellites. And I look in particular at the <coughs> low order uh, Fourier modes of the projected gas surface density and compare it to the data. Okay, this movie shows uh, the gas density response as M51 is interacting with its satellite. And this is one of the best fit simulations, the gas density images as a function of time. 
And I've marked the cross the center of the galaxy as well as the location of the satellite. And when we have a good fit to the lower 40 amplitudes, the satellite sits close to the tip of the short arm as it does in the real system. Now, I got started on this when I was a postdoc at Berkeley several years ago uh, when Leo Blitz showed me this H1 map of the Milky Way. Okay? And you can see large perturbations in the uh, gas surface density, which can't be explained in a purely isolated context. Okay? So I'm showing here the Fourier amplitudes okay, of the projected gas surface density relative to the axisymmetric, relative to the equilibrium as a function of radius. And you can see that the lower uh, amplitudes relative to equilibrium are quite large, therefore 20 to 30 percent, okay, well outside the solar circle, which can't be explained in a purely isolated context. So we ask the question, what caused these structures? And I started out by doing a grid of simulations of the Milky Way interacting with satellites. The gas density response uh, is shown here, and this is the stellar response. And I varied the satellite masses, the distance to close to approach, the orbital inclination, as well as the details of how we uh, simulate the structure of the primary galaxy. And I'm showing here a variance versus variance plot to give a sense of which simulations best fit the data. Okay, so this is simulation minus data whole squared for the m equal to one Fourier mode and the first four modes here added in quadrature, sort of like chi squared on both axes. Okay, and on this kind of plot, variance versus variance on both axes, the best fits lie close to the origin, which are produced, surprisingly, by a fairly massive progenitor, a 1 to 100 mass ratio progenitor, with a fairly close pericenter distance, 5 h inverse KPC. And the distance from the origin tells you how poor the fit is. Okay, so this also tells you that a 1 to 10 mass ratio progenitor uh, that gets within 15 kiloparsec wouldn't have produced the, di the disturbances in the outer H1 disk Milky Way, which is in fact consistent with analysis of the thickness of the stellar disk. Um, now, prior work uh, on trying to uh, understand the effects of the known Milky Way satellites is primarily focused on single satellite interactions with either high resolution and body simulations, but these are primarily used ad hoc initial conditions. So recently, uh, I've included the main tidal players of the Milky Way. Uh, this is now with gas as well as stars. Okay. And these orbits have been derived from the observed HST proper motions. So these are the most realistic uh, initial conditions. These are the most realistic orbits that we can use. And I did this because I wanted to ask the question, are the known satellites enough to explain the disturbances that we see in the outer H1 disk of the Milky Way? Okay, given the known senses, can we explain what we actually see? So on the same variance versus variance plot, okay, I'm marking uh, the effect of the LMC, the Sag dwarf, and the SMC. And you can see that it's far off uh, the origin, okay, and it doesn't exert the known satellites, even with the uh, most realistic initial conditions that we can derive for the orbits, don't exert an appreciable effect on the galactic disk. Okay, the LMC is basically too far away. Uh, to raise appreciable tides, and the Sag dwarf is an interesting candidate, but its last pericenter was more than a giga year ago, within which time the disturbances would dissipate in the outer gas disk because it's collisional. Of course, you see uh, structures in the stellar disk, as Chris Purcell has pointed out previously. Okay, so this stream here is the Sagittarius tidal debris. This is LMC and SMC coming in on the first approach. So, especially because of this, um, because I couldn't uh, explain the disturbances with the known satellites, even with uh, realistic initial conditions, 
a uh, couple of years ago, I was determined to see if I could find this thing. Okay, and a new survey had come out. It's a fairly deep infrared survey of the galactic plane. It's about three magnitudes deeper than two mass. The beast of variables of the Via Lactea, which has light curves in the K-band and photometry from Z through K. So I went through the survey, trying to see if we could find this thing. And I was looking for two independent distance measures. Okay, red clump stars have been shown to be fairly good standard candles, as well as, uh, of course, Cepheid variables. All right. So if you can, uh, here I'm using the uh, period luminosity relation of Cepheids in the uh, near infrared and the K band. Now, near infrared light curves uh, have been known to be challenging in terms of classifying variables, so I used a series of successive cuts to try and filter out uh, false positives. Okay, so first I required a high significance in the uh, lom scargo periodogram for the sources that pass that first test. I then require a very tightly constrained uh, period distribution. Okay, so I do a parametric bootstrap and uh, uh, I only retain sources that have a fairly narrow width in the period uh, histogram. And finally, I look at the shape of uh, the light curve, okay, and I retain sources at that third test that have uh, Fourier parameters that are consistent with uh, known Cepheid variables as observed in the uh, K-band. And there were a few that passed uh, this series of what I would say are fairly stringent tests and using the period luminosity relation in the K-band, I derive a distance of, on average, of about 90 kiloparsec, which is very close to the current predicted distance of the dwarf galaxy uh, that I predicted several years ago. Now these are, I would still say these are Cepheid candidates um, without uh, spectroscopic confirmation you know, we, we can't uh, fully declare uh, victory. Um, I'll also note that there is an overdensity of red clump stars, again, red clump candidates, uh, in the CMD. That is, if you extinction correct and uh, subtract out a background field, you do see an excess uh, at the same distance. So I'll go ahead and summarize. Uh, I find that Analysis of perturbations in the coal gas is useful for constraining the mass and location of perturbers, whether they're dark or luminous. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is that when you're looking at structures in the outer H1 disk, in terms of modeling this, you don't have to worry as much about, say, things like star formation or feedback. Okay, so you have a relatively clean tracer of perturbations. I've tested this method by applying it to um, galaxies that cover a fairly wide range in perturbed to primary gas ratio from 1 to 100 to 1 to 3. We find it works. Very recently, uh, we announced the uh, discovery of clustered Cepheid variables, longitude of minus 27 and latitude of uh, minus 1, so closer to the galactic plane than uh, any uh, known dwarf galaxy and at a distance of 90 kiloparsec. So we're currently um, involved in trying to get follow-up spectroscopic observations. We have to do this in the near infrared because getting optical spectra is, is uh, too challenging. And uh, my graduate student is, as we speak, trying to also get I-bound light curves to uh, confirm um, the periods if it is confirmed, it would be the first dwarf galaxy that was predicted by dynamical analysis to be subsequently discovered. And these kind of systems can yield very tight constraints on the dark matter distribution, and in principle can help to reverse this observational status quo. Thanks for your attention.
So uh, I'm using, basically I'm taking the observed HST proper motions and I integrate backwards from the measured uh, positions and velocities and I sample that range, so there's obviously uncertainty, so I do sample it. So I have an orbital distribution uh, and given that orbital distribution, I then integrate forward uh, with uh, the SPH code gadget. So um, at that point, what is left unspecified, given that you've specified your orbital distribution, what, what is left unspecified are the masses of the satellites. Okay, and I assumed uh, the mass for the LMC from Nithya Kalibayal's papers, and um, it doesn't make a big difference though, because given the distance of the LMC, there you know isn't that much of a play that you can get with the LMC mass. For the Sag dwarf, um, there's some earlier work that I did on on deriving masses of tidally disrupting satellites. And I, you know, it, it's coming from that, the, the mass of the Sag dwarf, which is about 10 to the 10 solar masses, which is consistent with the recent observations uh, by Belakurov. Can you say what the mass of the satellite is? Do you have any idea what the mass of the discovered satellite is? So the progenitor, the progenitor mass of the putative satellite is about 10 out of 10 solar masses. The uh, stellar, um, yeah, approximately. So the stellar mass, um, if you, you know, if you count from the red clump stars, right, the red clump candidates is about roughly uh, several 10 to the seven, okay? But beyond that, I can't cite, at the moment, I can't cite a, it's about seven kiloparsec. So, it's several hundred million years ago. So you essentially, you need a massive progenitor that comes pretty close recently. So these are the three basic conditions. Uh, and that's why, you know, you have to rule out something like the LMC. It's too far away. And that's also why you have to rule out the Sag dwarf. Okay, it, it, it is massive enough and it has a relatively close pericenter. It's just that the, you know, within the last uh, period under that, that it was about a giga year ago, and within that time, the disturbances would dissipate in the outer gas disk because it's collisional. Yeah, so I deliberately chose, you know, when I was showing the variance versus variance plot, I deliberately chose fairly coarse metrics. Uh, and those metrics are not that sensitive to things like the star formation rate and the feedback. And that, that's actually one of the, the main uh, advantages of looking at the outer H1 disk as a tracer, right? So things that we uh, don't understand terribly well. I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of progress in modeling feedback. But when you're looking at the outer H1 disk, there's very little molecular gas. Okay, so as a result, you don't have to worry as much about these things as in the inner regions of galaxies. So it's, it's a relatively tr clean tracer of perturbations.